Hi, I'm Mr. Levier, and I'm here at the University of Ottawa. And we are here with Laurent, and he's going to tell us about some of their amazing quantum work that they do here and some of the uh, amazing equipment that we can see. Hi, I'm Laurent. I'm a PhD student at the University of Ottawa, and this is our scanning tunneling microscope. Uh, this is in the group of Professor Adina Lucan Mayer. The principle of a scanning tunneling microscope is you have an atomically sharp tip. So you have a tip that at the very point is you know just a few atoms. Um, so very, very, very sharp. And then what we do is we bring that tip very, very, very close to the surface of a sample we want to study. And we get it so close that we get quantum tunneling between the tip and the sample. And this is really interesting because it allows us to take very, very high resolution pictures of the things we're studying. So if you want to study something with an optical microscope, uh, a photon is, has a wavelength on the order of hundreds of nanometers. Green light is like 500 some nanometers. So you can't really image anything smaller than about a few hundred nanometers with an optical microscope. Uh, however, atoms in a crystal are on the order of less than a nanometer apart. So if you want to take a picture of an atom, you can't use a regular microscope. So instead you use one of these scanning tunneling microscopes. Um, because your tip is so sharp, the current between the tip and the sample will be very, very sensitive to what is right under the tip. And so in this way, we're able to take the pictures, take the picture of atoms in a crystal. Um, we can also do some other interesting stuff. Uh, we can, by looking at the relationship between the current and the voltage we apply between the tip and the sample, we can learn a little bit about the internal electronic structure of a crystal. And that lets us probe some interesting physics in, uh, you know, new crystal systems. And this particular instrument uh, is a low temperature, ultra high vacuum STM. So it's, you see we have this big metal case, a little window you can look through here. Inside the case, the pressure is very, very, very low. Right now we're at 5.5 times 10 to the minus 10 torr. So that's extremely low pressure because atmospheric pressure is 760 torr. Um, so that's, you know, you can do the math, but something like a trillionth of atmospheric pressure. Um, the reason we need to do that is because if you have your tip in your sample, uh, if you have a molecule of air get between your tip and your sample, it's going to mess up your image. So you want to get as much of the air possible out of your chamber before you do an experiment. The other thing this can do is it can bring your sample down to a low temperature. Um, this is because you can imagine you know, as things heat up, they're shaking more and more. So if you have a tip above a sample and they're both kind of shaking, uh, you get a much worse image than if you can get them to be still. So what we do is we cycle helium through this line here. It comes into the cryostat and then down into the main body of the STM. Um, and we can get the helium down to uh, on the order of eight Kelvin. So it has to be helium instead of some other substance because helium has, you know, a very, very low freezing point. Um, and so this allows us to, in practice, we can't get 8 Kelvin because you lose a little bit of temperature between the cryostat and the main body. But in practice, this means we can take data at temperatures around 9 Kelvin, uh, which is not as cold as some, as some systems, but, you know, it's still very, very cold um, and allows us to, you know, take high quality data with this instrument. So this is kind of a visualization of the kind of effect that you get? Yeah, that's right. So th this uh, particular piece of art was for a project where we study defects in a crystal. So this crystal you see down here is, you know, an artist's rendering of uh, tungsten dye selenide. And what you can see here is mostly it's a nice regular crystal, but in certain points you have what we call vacancy defects. So in this spot, you know, there's supposed to be an atom, but there isn't one. Um, and that happens in a natural crystal some of the time. Uh, you can also have uh, substitution defects. So for example, over here, you have instead of one of these uh, selenite, selenium atoms, you have some other atom, maybe an oxygen atom that's replaced it. Um, and there are different kinds of defects, but these are a few that happen in this material. And what we can do with our STM is we can uh, you know, bring our tip very close to one of these defects and we can study the effect that that defect has on the local electronic structure. Wow, that's amazing. So here we have some examples of things we work on in our group. 
Um, our group specializes on what we call two-dimensional materials. So these are materials where you can get a single sheet of atoms. So, you know, how is that possible? Well, the classic 2D material is graphene, which comes from the graphite uh, like you find in your pencil. And what you find is in graphene, you have sheets of atoms that are bonded to each other covalently. Now we know covalent bonds tend to be very strong bonds. However, the, in, the sheets themselves are just held together as layers by van der Waals uh, forces. And we know that van der Waals forces tend to be pretty weak forces. And so it's possible to peel off a single layer of graphene from a crystal of graphite. And so this way we're able to get a sheet of atoms uh, with only a single layer. Uh, so how do we do this in practice? Well, what we'll do is we'll take a little chunk of graphite and we'll put it on a piece of scotch tape and we'll peel the tape over on itself several times to thin down the graphite and then we'll push it down on a piece of silicon and when we peel it off what we get is a mix of things. We get some chunks of graphite but we're also to able to get single layers of graphene, bilayers of graphene, and everything in between. Um, so in this way we're able to get very very thin uh, layers of atoms. Uh, in fact, you can do this for a bunch of different kinds of materials. Graphene is interesting because it's a metal, but we can also get insulators like boronitride, so that's a crystal made of boron and nitrogen, um, as well as semiconductors like molybdenum disulfide. Um, and uh, so this way we have all the different kinds of things you might, of different kinds of materials you might want. You have insulators, you have conductors, you have semiconductors, you can make all kinds of devices and circuit elements. Um, so now that we have all of these different circuit elements that are very, very thin and very, very small, we can combine them to make devices. Uh, so this is a device made by my colleague, um, where what they do is they have different layers of 2D materials, and they have gates printed with gold. So these are just very, very, very narrow pieces of gold. Um, and what they can do is they can trap an electron in this area between the gates. And it lives in one of these 2D materials and it's trapped by the gates so it's not able to get out when you apply the right voltage to the gates. Um, and so what this acts is it acts like an artificial atom. So just like an electron lives around an atom and it has different energy levels, um, but it takes a lot of energy to kick it off the atom. Same here, we have an electron trapped in this space here and it'll have different energy levels and we have some control over its properties. And so we can do things like this, like uh, combine a bunch of these to make a, a network of artificial atoms and explore how that might behave. Or we could use a single one of these and use it as a sensor. So if we use that single trapped electron to detect things, um, you know, that, that uh, is useful for certain sensing applications. The other thing, if we now uh, think back to our STM, I told you that you know, with your light microscope, you can't see atoms because atoms are much smaller than photons um, in general. Uh, we can see atoms with our scanning tunneling microscope. So here's an example of a piece of, a surface of a piece of graphite imaged with a scanning tunneling microscope. And each of these triangles is two little atoms. And so we're able to take a picture of the atoms directly. Um, that is amazing. <laughs> Actually photographing carbon, that's yeah. nuts. Well, the only way we know that we have graphene is when we have a single layer, we see this nice honeycomb structure, which looks exactly like what you'd expect a picture of graphene to look like. Um, you know, this images, there's some challenges in getting these images, uh, but on a good day, you can see something like this with an STM.